Welcome to Hey on Haven. I'm Dawn. Today we're discussing Chapter 17 of the Tale of Genji, Eowase. We'll start with our usual summary for shared context. Chapter 17 returns us to the main story while focusing on the former Issei priestess, the Rokujo princess. Her entry into palace service was arranged by Genji and Fujitsubo. The former emperor, Suzuku, was disappointed as he wanted her for himself. On the day of her presentation to the palace, he sent magnificent gifts and a poem. Genji, seeing these gifts, wonders if he made the wrong choice for the former priestess and insists she send a response. A poem is dispatched. The former priestess arrived at the palace very late at night. The emperor found her alluring. He was 13 and she, now styled as the Umetsubo or Issei consort, was 22. His majesty divided his evenings equally between the Umetsubo and the Kokiden, where Tono Chujo's young daughter resides as consort. Emperor Reze loves paintings, and Issei is a skilled artist. He spends increasing amounts of time with her. Tono Chujo sends paintings to his daughter that he has commissioned to draw the emperor back to his daughter's quarters. Seeing Tono Chujo's efforts, and because he would not allow those paintings to leave the Kokiden, Genji opened his collections for the Issei consort, all from ancient masters, and finally showed Murasaki some of his own work created while in Akashi and Suma during his exile. The paintings become a point of discussion among the palace women, and Fujitsubo divides them right and left in the manner of a poetry contest to argue the painting's merits. Genji comes upon this and suggests that they have a formal contest in front of his majesty. Tono Chujo continues working modern artists to supplement his daughter's collection. Retired Emperor Suzuku sends his personal collection to the Issei consort and paintings from his mother, the former Kokiden consort, to the new Kokiden consort. The contest is arranged and the ladies divided again left and right, Umetsubo and Kokiden. The Umetsubo consort's faction, assigned to the left, relied on old masters and classic tales with a red and lavender color palette while the Kokiden consort's faction, styled right, relied on modern tales by current masters in the green-blue color palette. All through the day, the score remained even. Then, in the evening, the last scroll from the left was Genji's illustrations of Suma and Akashi. The artistry was both a triumph and a surprise, which won the left the contest. Wine was had and Genji praised. Music was played until dawn. I'm excited to talk about the differences for this chapter because we have an unusual conflict between translations this time, but we'll begin our discussion with the title. Tyler defines Eowase as a picture contest in which two competing sides submit paintings in pairs for judgment. No such contest is known to have taken place in the period before the tale was written, but the one in this chapter follows the established pattern for poetry contests, Udawase. We'll discuss the picture contest in relation to poetry contests a little later. Let's get back to the titles. So, very specifically, we have e, meaning painting or picture, and awase, meaning match or contest. Our provided titles are all variations on the theme. Suematsu gives us a competitive show of pictures. Whaley's The Picture Competition is right in line with a picture contest used by both Seidenstecker and Tyler. Washburn broke out the thesaurus and gave us a contest of illustrations. These slight differences are wholly representative of the types of differences I usually see, the meaning being the same even if the words are a little different. Another instance of this minor translation detail that I've grown accustomed to, the names of instruments, keen, zithern, wagon, koto, sono koto, six, seven, and thirteen string instruments, biwa, and lute. Each translator has the version he prefers. These are the usual little differences, but at the beginning of chapter 17, we have one of those differences that makes me wonder. You may recall that Genji was asked to look after the Rokujo princess, the former high priestess of Ise, by her dying mother, the Rokujo lady. Genji had been considering moving her to Nijo, and Murasaki had even busied herself making preparations. But did she actually go? That depends on which translation you read. Suematsu doesn't mention it, but the other four have opinions. Whaley, Seidenstecker, and Washburn all say in one way or another that Genji had changed his mind and did not bring the former priestess to Nijo. 
Tyler gives the opposite, saying he had decided to bring her for the time being to Nijo. The other translators mention that essentially, out of deference to Suzuku's feelings, Genji decided not to bring her to Nujo. This is the first time I can remember that Tyler is the odd man out in the translations, and I honestly have no clue what to believe. I'm so very partial to Tyler's very academic translation that I give him the benefit of the doubt in most instances, but this time, I think he might have gotten it wrong. Every now and again, I've brought up what I perceive to be misogyny on the part of Whaley. I was primed to have to make that comment again, and maybe it's deserved, but there is also an occasional tone to the text that makes me think some of the downing of women may be from Murasaki Shigibu herself. This chapter has a good example. Here are two quotes from Whaley talking about the women as they discussed and argued about the merits of the paintings. Frivolous Feminine Comprehensions These feminine discussions are capable of continuing, more or less at cross purposes, for an indefinite length of time. Both of these quotes are mirrored in the other texts, but not perfectly. The first was said by one of the gentlewomen of the left to the gentlewomen of the right, insinuating that the right were superficial and shallow. In the Washburn translation, that line is definitely a veiled insult from the left to the right. Speaking about the tale of the bamboo cutter, the left states, because it is a tale of the age of the gods, it is no doubt beyond the understanding of superficial women. You can see why I don't think the first line is meant in a generally derogatory way. But that second line, Whaley seems to have put a little extra on the second line that the other translators don't share, and that's where I think the implicit bias comes in. As I've said before, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm extra sensitive, but it keeps coming up, so I think I'm seeing what I'm seeing. Washburn's version of the second line simply states, feminine disputation. These are the deceptively subtle of the translation differences, when it's not just phrasing something a different way, it's that the translator, in this case Whaley, adds a bit more than seems to be in the text based on what I'm seeing in other translations. Whaley's additions are not the same as, say, Washburn. Washburn also adds to the text, including the information a footnote would normally give within the text itself, but he explained that in his introduction. We have a few other differences, but they're in our costume references, so I'll come back to those. Let's talk about seasonality. This chapter mostly takes place in the third month, essentially April. The text speaks of early in the third month, when there is fair weather and not much to do at court because there are few ceremonies. Keep in mind that a good portion of what happened at court were the ceremonies that the emperor had the lead obligation in, and the courtiers all had their roles to play. Since we've already rolled into our cultural references, let's continue with incense. When the Rokujo princess arrived at the palace, Suzuku sent a tremendous amount of very carefully chosen gifts to her. Among the items was incense. The incense presented was of a superior quality because it could be smelled at well over a hundred paces that was the standard for high quality incense. I've often thought about how beautifully and brightly colored the court would be but I need to add to that visual, the inevitable olfactory element. Robes were perfumed by placing them either on a wicker rack over incense or by virtue of being stored with incense. Fragrance will play a larger role in the last third of the tale. Several times in this chapter, we're told of the gifts that were given to someone. Twice, messengers were rewarded, once in accordance with his rank and in another instance, lavishly. As mentioned earlier, when the Rokuju princess was introduced at court, Suzuku sent gifts of sublime quality to her, ornately carved comb boxes, magnificent sets of robes, a toiletry set, and incredibly high quality incense. And lastly, at the picture contest, Fujitsubo gives gifts and stipends to those at the contest, including an additional robe for Sachinomiya, who had received one already for serving as judge. You'll notice that robes are frequently given as gifts and what are being called gifts are more often goods in exchange for services rendered. Before we launch into clothing references, let's briefly discuss poetry contests, as the picture contest of the chapter was set up in a similar fashion. In a poetry contest, Uta Owase, the participants are divided left and right. There is a judge, and each side presents a poem for the provided topic. The poems are judged against each other with a winner or as a tie. 
At the end of the contest, one side or other is judged the winner. If you would like more in-depth information regarding poetry contests, I've put a link in the description down below to a video by Waka Poetry that I highly recommend. I believe I recommended that channel to you before. I'm a big fan. So, in this chapter, we have Eowase, a picture contest structured as Utaowase, a poetry contest. The two factions were divided left and right. Each presented one illustration at a time to be judged. Sachinomiya, Genji's half-brother, sat as judge. The part that I find fascinating, and I'm sure you'll be shocked, is that the division between left and right extended to the accoutrement of the pictures, the wood for the tables, brocade covers and spindles and such, and then to the clothing. As I said in the summary, reds and purples for the left, the Umetsubo faction, and blues and greens for the Kokiden group. We're going to dig in a little deeper to those color divisions and the ensemble that is described. In the text, we're given examples of page girls, six for each side, that are dressed in what Washburn calls white ceremonial robes over particular colors of layered robes. We'll just throw out the clothing terms Whaley has decided to use. As usual, Whaley gets the clothing all wrong. I think translating the outermost garment as scarves and once again using the term tunic. The white robes the page girls were wearing are called kazami by Suematsu, and if you dig into Tyler's glossary, you'll find that the dress gown is used sometimes to mean kazami, especially when referring to the dress of page girls. Here's where I'm glad I have a more extensive knowledge of Heian dress. I have a firm grasp on what the garment looks like. Here are images of a young girl in kazami from the Costume Museum in Kyoto. There's a link to the webpage down below. The kazami in that image is a peachy color, and I highly recommend the line drawings you can see at the Costume Museum's website. In the description down below, I have links to the museum's updated website and two different versions of kazami. The kazami ensemble is also the cover image for one of my favorite books on costume. It's entirely in Japanese, but the title translates to Wearing Period Costumes, and it was edited by the Japan Kimono Education Association. In the description down below is the proper title in Japanese. The reason I love this book is it shows the process of getting dressed, the art of which is called kitsuke, and it shows the process in fabulous detailed photographs. The garment, kazami, follows the usual geometric construction of Japanese upper body garments of the time, but the collar is bound in a round style, similar to a men's soko tie, rather than the long and rectangular collar attached to the length of the garment like a kosude or modern kimono. The sleeves are one and a half panels wide, and the side seams are left undone, letting the garment spill a bit like ribbons on top of the other layered robes. It is a crossbody garment, like the robes or gowns worn under it, but the round collar can be folded back when worn, resembling the lapels of a modern blazer and exposing the lining, if any. In the few images of recreations I've seen, the garment did not appear to be lined. The entire ensemble, from the outside in, consists of the kazami, an akome, a garment worn between the outermost robe and the inner robes, an uchigi, a robe slightly shorter and more narrow and usually more expensive detailed than the robes below, then uchiginu, or itsutsuginu, a grouping of typically five but up to twenty robes in a specific color scheme called kasane no irome. Under that is a hitawe, an unlined garment that serves as the base for all the garments worn above it. Under all those robes is a kosode and two pairs of long hakama, or nagabakama, a dark reddish purple longer pair, and a white slightly shorter but still longer than the leg pair of pleated trousers. Now that you have an idea of what was worn, Let's talk about the colors being worn and some more translation differences. First, the left, Umetsubo's faction. The page girls wore kazami in cherry layering, white over red. Whaley says the left's tunics were scarlet and their kasane, color combination, layered gowns were blue with light green inside. Here I'll take a small pause. According to everything I have read and studied in the past two decades, Blue was never part of any formal kasane no irome color combination. I find it absolutely confounding that kasane, which are built around natural objects like flowers and trees, I'm thinking of combinations like umegasane, plum layering, or matsugasane, pine layering, 
were entirely devoid of blues to reference the sky or sea. Blue was used by noblemen as a court rank color. Now, outside of the aristocracy, blue in the form of indigo was common, and it may be this commonness combined with it being a court rank color that made noble women eschew its use. I need to do more research. If anyone knows of a blue cassonet documentable to the Heian period, please share your source with me. I've been looking for it for a long time. Back to the page girls of the left. Seidenstecker translates the layerings to be in scarlets and lavenders. Tyler gives cherry gazami over red and layerings of wisteria, lavender, and scarlet. Washburn concurs. There are a number of color combinations, casane no irame, that use lavender and scarlet appropriate for spring, but the wisteria combination in particular is typically worn in the fourth month. So if that was what some were wearing, these page girls were pushing the season slightly as it was only just after the 20th of the third month. For the right, the kazami was willow, or white over green, with layerings in carrier rose. This is a yellow combination. Suematsu says it is yellow over red, while Whaley indicates a brown robe with a yellow lining, which is quite close. Seidenstecker disagrees, calling the colors grayish green lined in yellow. Seidenstecker is wrong. Tyler says willow kazami with layerings of carrier rose over green, and Washburn calls the robes mountain rose yellow. In Liza Dalby's kimono, Fashioning Culture, she says that the classic Genji Yamabuki combination was old leaf tan, kuchiba, over pure yellow, ki. There are three variations of the Yamabuki or Karia Rose Kasame, and all of them use a blue green hitue. I know Tyler said green and not blue green. The color's name is Ao, and in the Heian period, that color was likely a blue green, almost teal color. Willow is the same. The green is actually O. Oh. One last note, the cherry and willow combinations are layered frequently with the white being sheer so that the lining shines through creating a third frosted color. Not only were the page girls in colors divided left from right, but even the women serving the emperor were dressed for the occasion in cassone representing one side or the other. At this point in the project, I'm starting to learn the voice behind each translation. I keep coming back to the feeling of receiving the tale like individual letters for each chapter. So I'm envisioning a person with each translation and they become more clear with each chapter. I've had the thought of picking one of the women from the tale that I think personifies the voice of a particular translation. For example, Whaley's antiquated language reminds me of Shosho, Jiju's ancient aunt who serves the princess Hitachi, while Suematsu conjures perhaps the Akashi lady's mother or even the Rokujo lady. Of our later three translators, at least one makes me think of someone we haven't met yet, so I'll save that for later. How are you feeling as you read the tale? Do you imagine hearing the story from some knowledgeable gentlewoman? We also say goodbye to Suamatsu. This was the last chapter he translated. I included this partial translation only because it was the first. I won't miss the frustration of only getting part of the story, but I will miss the use of Japanese terms. I did enjoy his style, the voice he brought to the tale. What stood out for you in this chapter? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. Join me next time for chapter 18, Matsukaze, Wind in the Pines. Subscribe if you'd like to explore the Heian period of Japan with me through the tale of Genji.